Hello, everyone, and welcome tonight. It's Sunday night, uh, November 5th, 2023, and my name is Glenn Rawson. I welcome you here tonight. Uh, I would invite you along the way somewhere tonight to uh, send me a note, tell me how many are watching, tell me where you're watching from, and also a request. You know, we have the Christmas season coming up, and if there's a sacred Christmas story, either from your pioneer past or from your life that you would like to share, I would be honored if you would share it with me. And as I've said so many times, if you have any stories that are appropriate for me to share, that are inspiring, that have built your testimony or strengthened the testimony and faith of others, I would be honored if you would share those. You can send those stories to either directly to me or you can send them to support at glenrossonstories.com and Kristen will take care of them. So again, I thank you tonight and I invite you if, you if you feel so inclined to share this fireside with somebody else. I ask for your faith tonight and your prayers because I'm going to do something I've never done before. I don't have a story to tell you tonight. I have one story, just a single story. And it's um, delicate enough for me to share that uh, I ask for your prayers and for your faith because it's very close to the heart. Here's why. Whenever I go out on tour, it never fails that someone asks me to share my conversion story. And I always duck that. Um, I always avoid that and uh, try to weasel my way out of it. J even when I'm out on tour, people want me to introduce myself on the bus. And I generally figure out a way that I can get out of that because I just don't like to. Um, early on, uh, you know, it was no big deal. But the older I've gotten, the more I've become hesitant to share my conversion story. Well, this last week has been most interesting. And because of that, um, I was sitting in church today and uh, it was a fast and testimony meeting. And one dear sweet sister who is dying of cancer shared her testimony. We all understood. We don't know for sure, but it could well be her last testimony. We didn't know, but it was very touching. And as Sister Davis shared that sweet and powerful testimony with what voice she had left, it came to me that today, once and for all, I would just share my conversion experience. So if you don't mind, and you would pray for me, I would like to share that experience once and for all and name some of the people that were instrumental in that conversion along the way. First of all, I begin with this. As many of you know, I grew up as a ranch cowboy in Idaho. Um, my parents made the decision when they got married that they would never push religion on their children because religion had been pushed on them, crammed down their throats is the way they would put it, and they had turned against church and all forms thereof, not any particular denomination. They just wanted nothing to do with any church. So when I came into the world, I grew up without any religion at all. God was never mentioned in my home except take his name in vain. And as I grew older, I knew nothing about God. I knew nothing about Christ. I knew nothing about the scriptures. I was never taught but growing up where I did, there were a lot of Latter-day Saints in the area. And that created an interesting, interesting situation because a lot of my classmates, I, to this day, I don't know who for sure, a lot of my classmates were Latter-day Saints. And so occasionally I'd toddle off to primary with them because we would leave school, elementary school, and the, 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 the church house was just a few hundred yards down the road. And all the kids had come out of school and run to primary. I went along with them, not knowing what in the world that was. And uh, I went once in a while. And, and, and as I got to be a teenager, uh, brother and sister Fail, Carol Fail, love that woman. Uh, she would 
she would look, stop by the ranch and pick me up and take me to Mutual. Again, I was just hanging with my friends. I didn't know anything about it, and I was dumber than a post. So I grew up around Latter-day Saints, and, and, and they were my friends, you know, I guess, as far as that goes. But, but then the other interesting thing was is that growing up in a community where there are a lot of Latter-day Saints, my dad really had a strong dislike for the Latter-day Saints. He had been offended when he was just uh, late teens, early 20s, and he never had a kind thing to say about the church, members of the church and made fun of them constantly and ridiculed them, and for all intents and purposes, he hated them. And uh, my mother was a little more soft-spoken. She didn't say much about it, but my dad was pretty vocal. And that was all of my growing up years. And then in my late high school years, Again, I went to Mutual a few times with friends. Usually we'd play basketball, and that would become, as you know, a brawl. <laughs> Those were usually uh, orchestrated fights that begin and end with prayer. And so that wasn't overly helpful. And right near, I guess it was been the summer of my senior year, members of that ward where we lived in asked me. They just came over one day and asked me if I'd get baptized. And I had not the least incl inclination. And I'll be very candid. I'll be very honest with you. I was a cowboy. I learned how to drink. I learned how to smoke. I learned all about tobacco. And uh, the highest ambitions in my life at that time when I finished high school was to be a rodeo cowboy, a ranch cowboy, and maybe drive a truck. That's all my aspirations were. But my dad, bless his heart, never got much of an education, and it was always his sight from the very beginning that at least since he didn't get the chance, I would go off to college. And so I was just kind of pushed in that direction. So indeed, I got out of high school. I was 17. I was 17, and I went off to college. And it just so happened that in searching for a place to live, now mind you, there wasn't a religious bone in my body, long red hair, red beard, and I was rough around the edges in every respect. And uh, I went off to college, and in searching for an apartment, I moved in with a bunch of guys that were Latter-day Saints. Uh, and one of them had just come back off his mission. And, um, and then there was an apartment. I lived in apartment 18. There was a bunch of girls over here in apartment number 21. This is off-campus housing. And they were all Latter-day Saints. And my apartment and these girls all constituted something called a family home evening group. That started in September, late August, early September. And through September, October, November, these, these, these young adults became the best friends I'd ever had. One day, this was probably November, I'm sitting in my apartment and one of my roommates came in and he was a brand new convert to the church, great big guy named Paul. Uh, and he was just full of vim and vinegar and brand new religion and he was so excited about it. I wasn't. One night he came home and said, hey, Glenn, let's go see a movie. I said, okay. So we started walking, and we walked across the ISU campus. But instead of going to the student union building where the theater was at, we went right past the student union and started up towards Red Hill. And there was this building looming on the hill up there. What is that? And um, we entered that building, and, went, and it was dark, and went all the way down this long corridor to the other end, and uh, he stopped and turned and opened a door, and there was a brightly lit room right there at the end of that long, dark, dark corridor. And inside was a, was a 16 millimeter projector sitting in the middle of the floor. Lights are all on, and there were two young men in there with, with suits and white shirts and buzzed haircuts and grins so wide you could have tied him behind their ears. Evidently, this was a command performance of a movie. I had no clue what this was all about. And I sat down, and they showed me a brand new movie. 
It was called The First Vision. It had just come out, starring Stuart Peterson. And when the movie was over, they asked me something like this. I don't remember all the questions, but they said, do you believe that Joseph Smith is a prophet? Well, my answer was, uh, uh, sure. What they didn't realize is just how stupid I was. Who's Joseph Smith? And what's a prophet? But I answered it that way because I guess I could see that's the answer they wanted. And, oh, they got so excited with that answer. And they asked me several more questions. And I must have answered them the right way because they were so excited and they wanted to come back and tell me more. Okay, sure, I don't care, you know, whatever. So they came back. This time it was at the girls' apartment right next to mine and my roommates and all the girls were gathered around and they were teaching me this stuff about the church. And I don't know if it was in that one or when they tried to set up the next one, suddenly, boo, the lights went on and I realized, these people are trying to convert me. And I didn't want to be converted. I liked my bad habits and I liked my life, at least I thought. And so when the next appointment came, I hid in my room. I didn't want to show up. I was going to stand them up. I didn't care. But Paul, noticing that I wasn't there, came to find me. And he found me in my room and he said, you have an appointment. And he just grabbed me. Paul stood 6'6". Six, six. He just grabbed me and hauled me off to the discussion. Once again, a command performance. Well, the discussions lingered on into December. All my roommates and the girls all went home for Christmas break. I didn't because I was working off campus. And uh, the missionaries came over one night. I was the only one there, I think, and asked me if I'd get baptized. And I said, not a chance. I'm not interested. That was it. That was it. We went through the Christmas holidays and on into sometime in early January. And one night, I was at home I think I was home by myself, and um, it was cold outside, really cold outside, but I had this, I'm sorry, I guess I had this barbaric habit that I'd inherited from childhood. I came home that night, and it just peeled my shirt off. Well, the, there came a knock at the door, and I opened up the door, and it was just jeans, <laughs> boots, no shirt, and I opened up the door. And there stood this young man and a friend all bundled up against the cold. I mean, they were really, it was cold outside. And the young man at the door, I didn't know him. I'd never seen him. He said, uh, are you Glenn? Yeah. And he said, my name's Kelly Schofield. And then he said something that just caught me off guard. He said, you look like a rodeo cowboy. I said, I am. And he said, my dad was a rodeo contractor. Come on in, brother. So he came in along with the stake missionary, Bob, that was with him. And it turned out, yeah, he was a Latter-day Saint missionary. He was only 20, 21. But we sat down, as I recall, I don't remember all the details because it's a long time ago, but that night it was a pretty pleasant discussion. We just talked about horses and cows and rodeo stock, and he was from Winona, Minnesota at the time. Uh, Bob was a local guy, a stake missionary, an older fellow that was there to help him. That first discussion went really well because we didn't talk about religion. We talked about horses, and I could talk about that all day. Well, they left, and a short time later, a week, a few days later, Elder Schofield came back. And I think Bob was with him again, as I recall. Again, all the details are a little fuzzy, but, but I remember Schofield came back not that long later. And this time, somehow, things changed. 
And I don't remember all that we talked about that night, but all of a sudden, the nice guy talking about rodeo stock, that was done. He was here on business. And although I don't remember the exact words he used, he taught, he said to me, look, if you stay on the course your life is on, you're going to go to hell. You're going to ruin your life. You're going to go to hell. He said, the right thing for you is to join the church and make something out of yourself. Either join the church or your life is going to hell. Now, before and since, I've never seen a missionary talk to somebody that way, like he talked to me. It was offensive. I look back now, it was the only way he could get through my stiff neck and my hard heart, but he punched right through all the way to the core and he made me so mad. I just sat there with bald fists with Schofield on one side and Bob on the other thinking to myself, I just like to bust his nose. All I want to do is hit him because he was so blunt spoken and I'm not kidding. Straighten up or go to hell. And the last thing he said that night before he left is, I'll give you three days. Make up your mind. In effect, he was saying, you can't sit on the fence, son. It's one way or it's the other. He had no idea that he was touching a cord. He was striking a nerve because my dad had always said that to me. My dad's way of saying it was whole hog or none, boy. Do it right or don't do it at all. And here's Schofield dancing on the same nerve. Well, he left that night and I was just furious. But over the course of that next three days, my roommates all came home and the girls, or not came home, but came back to the apartments. School was about to start. They all came back. They all found out about what had happened. And I expected them to just jump on me and give me every argument about why I should become a Latter-day Saint but they didn't. They sort of took it easy and let me think it through. And um, by the night of the third day, I still had no idea what I was going to do. For some reason, I didn't just blow them off and say, you think I'm going to hell? But I didn't do that. I gave it serious consideration. For some reason, I don't know why. And uh, at the end of that third day, Schofield had told me to pray. I went back. I remember I walked back into my bedroom. It was dark late in the evening. And I knelt down by my bed and I offered up a prayer like they had taught me to do. Nothing, at least as I perceived it. I didn't see anything. I didn't hear any voices. I didn't noticeably feel anything. I went out and talked to Rod Johnson, my roommate. And I remember thinking, this is so sissy talking about this stuff. What am I doing? But again, Rod didn't say, this is what you have to do, son. He didn't do that. He was just my friend. And I knew he'd be my friend no matter what decision I made along with the girls next door. That's the kind of friends I had. It didn't matter if I was, quote, Mormon or not. They were still going to be my friends and still love me. That I knew. I went back in my room and pondered it some more. And I don't know what happened, but something said to me, this is the right thing to do. So I took a can of tobacco and I set it on my clock radio and opened it up. I went in the kitchen. I made a pot of coffee, cowboy coffee, real coffee. Um, and I just left it there. And I said, I quit. I called Schofield and I said, all right, I'll do it. And he said, good. That's about all he said. Good. 
I'll have somebody there to interview you. I'd made up my mind, but I had no idea what I was doing or what I was getting into. Really didn't. All I knew was that the decision I had made just turned me into the black sheep of my family. That Saturday, a missionary that I didn't know came and interviewed me for baptism. How I ever passed that interview, I have no idea. I hadn't repented, but whatever. I passed the interview, and on January 22nd, I was baptized a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by my roommate, Rodney Johnson. My cousin Gwenda and her husband Jerry, they attended. They asked me if I were going to invite my parents, and I said no. And Gwenda, who had always been my closest friend, a Latter-day Saint, said, I think you should. So I did, and my dad kept his peace. Nobody said much that night. And um, I just remember the last thing. Th this is all I remember from that baptism. Is I The last thing I remember was Rod saying, grab your nose. I did, and down I went. And I came up a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But I didn't feel any different wet than I had felt dry because I had not yet repented. They took me out for dinner that night and feted me and gave me a brand new copy of a leather-bound copy of the Book of Mormon, which I still have on the shelf right up there. It pretty well worn. Retired it a long time ago. Well, that began a remarkable odyssey for me because I was baptized Saturday night and went to church for the first time the next day. Now, I'd been to church here and there, off and on, primary, and mutual, things like that, but go to church to worship. Went to church for the first time the next day. And I immediately recognized that I didn't fit here very well. Long red hair, thick red beard. I didn't have, I didn't have a white shirt. I didn't have a, a suit. I didn't even know how to tie a tie. And we'd be sitting in Sunday school class and somebody would say, turn to Mosiah 2. And I had an old seminary Bible that the, my girls had given me in this hand and a brand new triple combination in this hand. And I'd look at them and go, Okay, which book is that? And where is it? And by the time I'd even figure out what book it is, they had quoted the verse, interpreted it, and moved on to the next one. They would talk about going to the stake center. Their concept of a stake and mine, a stake center, two different things. I couldn't speak the language. I didn't have the clothes. I didn't understand all these strange practices. Firesides? Your idea of a fireside and mine are two different things. I, I just didn't fit. And it was hard. Now, I can't tell you how hard that was. I remember that the night I got baptized, there were several people that got baptized, young adults, that same night. Over time, over the next few months, they all disappeared. I look back on it now, and probably the only reason I didn't disappear, there were two reasons. One of them are those very dear friends who are still, 40-some years later, still my friends, and I still love them. But the other reason that I didn't disappear is one of the last things Elder Schofield had said to me was, Read the Book of Mormon every night. I hardly knew what it was. But for some reason, I don't know why, I started reading the Book of Mormon every single night, and I didn't understand a word of it. I, I, night after night after night, I would sit down and just read one chapter. 
I didn't understand the doctrine. I didn't know the story. There were Nephites. There were Lamanites. They didn't like each other. They were always killing each other. That was it. That's all I understood. And that went on for eight months, reading the Book of Mormon every night, not understanding a word of it, as often as not falling asleep on the book, you know, drooling on the page. So I went through that winter semester, and then I moved back home to work on the ranch through the summer. And, near, and, and I started going to church in my home ward, in the Wapello ward, Bishop Dean Early. What a wonderful saint. And I started going to church there, but but I would only go to sacrament meeting because I was so uncomfortable, still didn't fit, didn't belong there. Well, we reached August, and uh, still, I'm muddling along without a testimony, struggling to understand what in the world I'm doing, but still determined to keep going. By now, in my Book of Mormon study, I had gotten all the way up to 3rd Nephi. And one Sunday afternoon, I came home from church, and I don't know why, but I was the only one there. I was out on the ranch, out on the end of Weeding Lane, Parley Arby's place. And um, we were living in a trailer house. Mom and Dad were gone. I was the only one there. And I lay down on the couch with the Book of Mormon, no shirt on, and started to read. And I read, as I recall, 3rd Nephi chapter 8. And that's the chapter that's all about destructions and and thunder and lightning and whirlwinds and great destructions on the American continent when the Savior died in the old world. It was a pretty dramatic chapter, so much so that I fell asleep again with the book lying on my chest. What happens next, I don't really understand. But in that, in that weird state of between sleep and, and deep sleep, and I started to dream. And I dreamed about thunder and lightning and, 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 and heavy winds and rain. And at, at the exact same time that this is happening, a microburst hit the ranch and there was thunder and lightning and the door was open and I was right next to the door and, and, and it was raining and the wind was blowing and the walls of the trailer, this roof pounding and wow, it was intense. I don't know how long I was out like that, but when I woke up, I sat up. I was just soaked in sweat. I stood up and I turned back this way to go into the kitchen as though to go get something to drink. And as I did, mid-turn, a thought came into my mind. And it said, that book is true, meaning the Book of Mormon. And accompanying that message to my mind was a feeling, a warm, wonderful, pleasant feeling went all through my body. And I was filled with peace, joy, and certitude. Moments before, Mormonism was a mystery. And I didn't know if I belonged. And now, I knew. I knew that the Book of Mormon was true. And I knew because of that, that Joseph Smith was a prophet. And that the general message of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was true. I knew it. By some miracle some magic, I now knew it. Out of the ordinary, just a few weeks later, 
I was given the Melchizedek priesthood in the Blackfoot stake. President Ogden and others interviewed me, and I was ordained to the Melchizedek priesthood, or had the priesthood conferred upon me, and I was ordained an elder. I think the thought was that by so doing, I would go on a mission. I was now 19, prime age to go on a mission. Church got easier after that. The Book of Mormon got way easier. In the days, weeks, and the next year or so, I read the Book of Mormon six times. I couldn't get enough. I'd started driving big rigs now, 18-wheelers, and that Book of Mormon went everywhere I went. And when I was unloading, I'd read it. When I was loading, I'd read it. When I would stop at the truck stop for dinner, I'd read it. It went everywhere I went. Six times over that next year, I couldn't get enough of the Book of Mormon. But I had no desire to serve a mission. All I had known about missionaries was guys in white shirts uh, with buzzed haircuts and pushy attitudes. I wanted no part of it. I wanted no part of it. That went on now for years. Over the course of the next four years, I was taught little by little. One day, not long after that, I was sitting in the home of a friend, Emma Moon. And Emma and I were just talking. And suddenly, like a bolt out of the blue, we weren't even on the subject, a feeling unlike anything I'd ever known before. It just came over me. Emma was sitting over here on the sofa. I was sitting here on the love seat. We were just chatting, and suddenly, like a bolt out of the blue, a feeling came into me like I'd never known before that said to me, you are loved. And I felt it. I felt such a powerful sense of joy somewhere out there. The message was sent by someone, I love you. And I got it. I was never the same after that. I knew, I've always known, God loves me. The refinement process continued. There came a most interesting year. I was about, it was my 22nd year, as I recall. And um, that year started off dramatically. Some friends and I went out to the ranch of a friend, Todd Gilbert, and we were playing around with a team of horses, so out riding a te- uh, running a team of horses in a sleigh out through the fields and just having a great time. And I was standing up on front of the sleigh and all of a sudden the team went like this and the sleigh jerked and the post I had wrapped my hand wrapped around broke off and I fell down between the rear end of the horses and the front of the sleigh. And I don't know what happened. I can't wait to see the movie, but I got smashed between the sleigh and the horses. I got a big old post driven right into my back, right at the belt line. I was badly banged up and bruised. I was still recovering from that when a short time later, I was at work and I was operating a hand truck, uh, a dolly, some people call it, and I was carrying some mattress springs and they slid off and unbeknownst to me, there was a piece of wire on one of those mattress springs about that long, sharpened to a very fine point that mattress went right down over my hand and just ripped that thumb right down to the bone. They hauled me off to the hospital and they put stitches in it. A few days later, I was coming back from a college final and a lady ran through a stop sign and hit me. I was on a bicycle. She ran through a stop sign and hit me on the bike and I went head first into the asphalt, landed right there, and just ground my face 
into the asphalt. Off to the hospital I went again. This time the doctor walked in. By now we were on a first name basis. What did you do now? And I spent the next several hours in plastic surgery as they picked all the rock and gravel out of my face and called in a plastic surgeon and sewed my face back together. Well, shortly after that, maybe a month or two later, I still wasn't completely recovered. I was at work one day and I was changing a big truck tire. And I was taking tires off the rim and putting new ones on. And these were big steel split rim tires. Some of you know what that means. Well, in changing that split rim tire, I had heard about these tires exploding. These split rims have had a snap ring about that wide that went all the way around and seated into a groove that held the tire on the rim. Those split rims were famous for blowing off under extreme pressure, decapitating guys. I didn't really want to be decapitated and I didn't trust it, so I flipped the tire upside down. And I, would, I was sitting on the edge of the tire, right there, with my hand down through one of the holes in the steel rim and was putting air in the tire. I checked it at about 80 pounds of pressure per square inch and put the air back to it. It required 110. Somewhere around 100 to 110 PSI. That snap ring blew off. It went down and left a quarter inch ring in the concrete. The tire became a rocket. It went into orbit. It went up and hit the top of about a 15 foot shop and left a print in the insulation at the top of the shop. Evidently, I went with it because my hand, this one actually, was inside the tire, inside the rim. And when it went up, I went with it. I remember the explosion. And the next thing I remember was the sensation of falling. They later, when I came to, I was underneath an 18-wheeler, a grain trailer. And there was, the shop was filled with choking dust. I came to and there was dust everywhere. I could hear guys hollering my name and and I don't remember much after that, but evidently what had happened is when the tire blew up and went up, I went up with it because they found my blood all over the tarp on top of the trailer. Evidently I had the trailer the t- tire and I had parted company and I landed on top of that grain trailer with the tarp, bled all over it, and then rolled off 11 feet to the concrete. And that's where they found me. They hauled me off to the hospital. Again, another ambulance ride. This hand, can't really see it, but this hand was broken here and over here, and most of it was peeled off. This thumb was mangled and my, I don't, I don't even remember all the extent of my injuries, but I was a mess. This, all of this has occurred in just the space of about eight months. Not long after that, and I won't name names this time because it would be incriminating, but I suffered the worst pain of all, a broken heart. I found someone that I loved dearly. And um, I was so taken. And then she dumped me. She had her reasons, I don't know. But she dumped me. And I remember, I remember how painful that was. I can't even tell you that whole story about how painful that was because I hadn't been through anything like that. And the next day, I was sent to Wyoming, to Evanston, Wyoming, to deliver a load of cement. So I'm tooling just south of Cokeville, Wyoming, going along Highway 30. And I was so angry. 
at what had happened and what how I'd been treated. And I remember saying something like this. I didn't even realize I was talking to God. If you think I'm going on a mission now, you're crazy. I don't suppose you should talk to Heavenly Father that way, but I did. And then something just came over me that, that said, well, why not? You've got nothing left here to lose. Well, yeah. Why not go on a mission? I was 23 years old now. I had left home, Pocatello, angry at God. And when I came back six hours later, I was going on a mission, no matter what. My papers were filed by now, by now, and I, I left one thing out of that year. I'd also had major surgery. I had had ulcers since I was 16. After I blew up my hand, as soon as the cast came off, I got very, very sick. I'd had ulcers since I was 16. And now the scar tissue had closed off my stomach. And this is in the days before medical treatment. No pills for it. I was dying. I was starving to death because I couldn't eat anything. And they had taken me in and operated on me and did a gastrectomy and basically took everything in here and just sort of replumbed it. And it was right after I recovered from that experience when I got my broken heart. I had been through a year of war. Maybe it's, that's what it took for the Almighty to finally knock some sense into a dumb cowboy's head. I returned to Pocatello, papers were filed immediately, and since I didn't have a home ward, I left from the Pocatello stake, the Pocatello University stake, Bishop Kim Johnson. And out into the mission field in Iowa, I went to serve for two years. I was out there, and I was out about a month when the call came to shorten Latter-day Saint Young Men's missions to 18 months. I'd only been out a short time, so I didn't have any choice. It was 18 months. Other guys who'd been out longer got to stay for two years. It was 18 months. I gave everything I had to that mission because I had paid such a price, and I was older by four years than almost anybody out there. And I was a very serious missionary. Very, very serious about what I was doing. That mission changed me forever. When I came home from my mission, I never came home. I never came home. I went right to teaching at the Missionary Training Center. I got married. And while I was a student at BYU, I taught at the Missionary Training Center. And when I got out of BYU, not long after, I became a seminary and institute teacher. Along the way, we had seven children. And we worked hard. We gave it everything we had. We worked hard. And I cannot even begin to tell you the conversion experience that occurred teaching the youth of the church. Just before I became a seminary teacher, I was traveling in a big rig across the Bonneville Salt Flats. And I was kicking and debating myself. Do I really want to do this? Do I want to be a seminary teacher? And something came over me, a, a very powerful, compelling feeling. I was filled with love for the youth of the church, and the resolve settled down into my soul in the deepest levels. And I knew I would do anything it took to save the Lord's youth. And not just the youth. I would do whatever it took to bring souls unto Christ, no matter the discomfort. And trust me, 
a few weeks after I came home, I was asked to do a fireside hundreds of miles away. And since that time, 40 some years ago, I have done thousands, probably tens of thousands of firesides now over the all, all over the world because I will go and I will do whatever it takes to bring souls to Christ. I love my experience in church education. I love the students. And just like the mission field, I gave it everything I had while trying to be a husband and a father at the same time. Heaven only knows whether I succeeded or failed. But the time came when it was necessary for me and church education to part ways. And then I went to work not long after for the Joseph Smith Papers Project. I was tasked with helping to produce, to write, host, and produce a television series on the Joseph Smith Papers. I'll tell you just one experience. I was sitting in the church tower in the, in the archives one day and we were filming uh, for, the, for the television series. I'd made the comment flippantly sometime before that, that how are we going to make a television series with dusty old books and ratty old documents? Well, I had no idea that in the world of historians, that's heresy, what I had just said. Nevertheless, one day we were sitting in there and we had stood down for a minute to take a break. There were cameras everywhere and lights everywhere. And, and uh, it was a very intimidating environment for a boy that grew up on a ranch to be on the front side of a camera? Baby, that's, that's not what I grew up with. Nevertheless, I was sitting there and they wheeled in a little cart and on that little cart was, was a bunch of, quote, dusty old books. And with my little white Mickey Mouse gloves, I went over and I picked one of them up. And Brother Ron Esplin, venerable historian, wonderful scholar and a wonderful saint commented to me, do you know what that is? That book I was holding? No. He said, that is Joseph Smith's first journal. Oh, I opened it up and read, I, Joseph Smith, Jr., I was that close to the prophet Joseph in that moment. It was a sacred experience, a life-changing experience. I had known, I had known for decades that Joseph was a prophet, but I was about to know him in a way deeper, sweeter, and more transcendent than any knowledge I had had before. Over the course now of the next 15, let's see, it would have been 2007, 14 years, 15 years and still going, I, I was taught by and interviewed the wisest men and women of our generation who knew church history upside down, backwards, forwards, details that most of us have never even heard of. I talked to people who knew virtually the prophet Joseph like no one else except Joseph and perhaps even better than members of his own family. I was led into Joseph's journals. I saw his heart poured out on paper. I read his letters where he where he governed the church and taught and, and loved. And I, I read the accounts of all these people that knew him. And over the course of 15 years, I came to know
I came to know Joseph. The witness of the Spirit is the most convincing, but the witness of personal history is affirming. And I came to love him. in a way that I can't even describe. He led me, the prophet Joseph led me. The more I came to know Joseph, the more I came to know the Savior and love him. The age-old thing you hear all the time, that the enemies of the church say, if you really knew the story of your own history, if you really knew Joseph Smith, you would never be a member of the church. That is asinine. Wrong on every front. Ron Esplin said it best to me one day. He said, those who know Joseph the best love him the most. When you see people turn their back on Joseph, it is not because they know too much. It's because they know too little. I saw Joseph's weaknesses. I came to realize in a very real way, in detail, that Joseph was a man, just like everybody else. In fact, in some respects, he started lower than the rest of us. He had so much further to go, so much weakness to overcome. I saw his weaknesses. I saw his quote-unquote failings. But I saw what the Almighty did through him, to him, and because of him. And it made my witness and testimony stronger every day. over the course of the Joseph Smith Papers Project and the ensuing years of the History of the Saints television series with Dennis Lyman, I was taught about our history. I came to understand that the scriptures, the Book of Mormon especially, well, the Old and New Testament, the scriptures are an edited library of stories filled with doctrine and teachings. And that library has been edited by the Lord himself and given to all of us for our instruction and edification. And they've been canonized for our confidence and our use. But I came to know, not only is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Lord's Church, the Savior works in it, through it, and by it, and his spirit is all filled through that church. But I also came to know that just like Joseph, it is filled with people with weakness, but all oh, the miracles, the power of the spirit, the remarkable things in our history I came to know that the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with all of its warts and flaws, with all of its miracles and power, it's a divine history of a sacred institution, and it is true, and it affirms faith. My beloved friends, my conversion experience isn't singular. It's not unique. There are millions of people out there who can share a story just like mine, who know, just as I know, that the church is true. And some of them know it more, some of them know it less, because our conversion is not an event. It's a journey. And I'm still being converted. As recently as just a few days ago, I was poring over President Nelson's talk and something struck me. He said, don't let your prayers be a shopping list. Let your prayers be a lively discussion with your Heavenly Father. 
And for the first time in decades, it clicked. I knew what he meant. And my prayers since that moment have not been the same. Deeper, sweeter, more meaningful. The voice of the Spirit more clear and more compelling than it's ever been. I am still being converted, and there are great changes ahead for me and for others in my family, because the Lord isn't done with us. I know, as I couldn't ever have imagined when I was just a teenager, I know that Jesus Christ is my Savior, and oh, how I'm counting on that. He is my Redeemer because His atonement works. It's worked for me. Daily repentance has worked for me. Jesus is my Savior, my Redeemer, and the best friend in mortality I've ever had. And what President Nelson said is true. Our Father in Heaven's plan is fabulous. Not just the big general plan of salvation that's usually represented on the chalkboard as the Amway Circles of Salvation thing, but no, the plan of salvation that involves the atonement of Jesus Christ and the temple. The plan of salvation that's personal, that God knows the day I was to be born and the day according to the plan I'm to die that he has all of these foreordained opportunities, responsibilities, and gifts unique to me and to you. It is my witness, brothers and sisters, that our Father in Heaven's plan is fabulous. And that conversion is not a one-time event, it's a lifetime and beyond journey. And that Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith, and the chief executive officer of the plan of salvation and the plan for our exaltation. That is my witness. God bless you, brothers and sisters. My message tonight is simple. Don't jump ship. Stay the course. Stay on the covenant path. Follow President Nelson with religious detail and exactness. Go to the temple. Partake of the power that's there. Pray as he taught. Study the Book of Mormon. And the day will come if we will stay that simple, not easy, but that simple course that we will find ourselves exalted in glory beyond all comprehension with the loved ones we chose to spend eternity with. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.